Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming back, joining us on Family Fridays. Uh, we are going through the Bible basics. We're talking about apologetic evangelism. That's the series we're in. This idea that in the church we are supposed to be filled with hope, we are supposed to go out and share Jesus with other people, that we have evidence and reasons that we believe. And we need to go and tell other people about that. And so we've been going through the, the spiritual profiles, these different kinds of people that we're going to be meeting. And each of them has a distortion about who they think God is based on their circumstances. And we're just kind of giving those overviews to get us to thinking we may have some ways we can answer the questions that they have. Tonight we're going to be talking about the successful. Now, as always, as we get into it, I want to share a couple of quotes. Again, this is from John Knox, who was a, a minister and theologian. He said, you cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. That, that what we desire when we evangelize is to influence people to make a decision for Christ. If I have all this information and I'm just a really articulate speaker and I can be louder than other people, I can leave people beat up defeated. They, they know that I, I won an argument, but I've done nothing to share Jesus with them. And we in the church want to get back to influencing people. And then this quote from, from Dr. Tim Wallingford, we, we get this material that we're going through on apologetic evangelism from Dr. Wallingford. This is an updated book that he made, and it's Turning Church Members into Disciple Makers. I'm going to encourage you to go, go look at that book if you're interested in Becoming a disciple maker, becoming uh, someone who evangelizes, shares Jesus, th this book will really help. And he says, a key to bringing people to Christ is to first show God's love by our actions. And that's something maybe some of us in the church have forgotten, that people are not going to really care how much we know until they know how much we care. I, I know that sounds cliched, but it's true. Do we have this kind of love for them that's real? Do we love God and then do we love people? Because we have to do both if we want to be faithful to what Jesus has called us to and if we really want to reach unsaved people. So today we're going to go over this, this profile of people that, that we're calling the successful. So who are the successful? Pro probably the easiest way to define it is a person who has put their faith in their material things, that their focus in life is being comfortable, having things, getting a good job, having enough money to do all the things that they want to do. And if they are doing that, they feel pretty good about themselves. Now, the distortion they have about God tends to depend on where they're coming from. There's generally two kind of successful people I'm going to be looking at. The first is the, a person who doesn't believe in God at all. They've not put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ. The next, in our context, is, is in America, we're going to run into a lot of people who maybe are going to church or they have gone to church in the past. They, they say they believe in Jesus, but they still have some misunderstanding about who Jesus is and what he wants in their lives. So the first is, this person that doesn't know God, and they're going to say, I I'm fine because I'm successful. I've, I've got everything I need physically and financially. I'm, I'm healthy and I'm wealthy. And my life is really good. And I've known people like this before. I've listened to them, and they say they're really glad that Jesus is there for people who need him. But, but my life's really good, so I'm fine just the way I am. Because I have everything I could possibly need, most of what I want. The next group of people are people, again, kind of affiliated with the church or in the church, and they believe that God wants them, that his desire for them, the thing that is most important in their life with God, is that he wants them to be healthy and wealthy. There is a whole gospel, the health and wealth gospel, that this kind of way of doing church, especially in America, and we've exported it across the world where it's all about now. It's all about living your best life now. It's all about you name it and claim it. If you want something, you just say it and God will give it to you. 
The problem is that's not found in the Bible the way it's taught. So these people can get really successful, and then when there's a struggle or when you're trying to teach doctrine, it can really become a challenge for them to be surrendering to the biblical Jesus. There was a Pew Research poll back in 2008 <clears throat> about wealth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and here's the good thing is when they were asked, how important is it to be wealthy? Only 13% of the people that were in the survey said it was in, very important to them that they were wealthy. But then there was 43% that said being wealthy is somewhat important to them. So that, that's over 50% of the people in the survey in America thought that it was very important or at least somewhat important that they're wealthy. And I think if you look at the TV, if you look at the newspapers, magazines, if you go online and read articles, you will find out that in America we seem to be a little bit obsessed with money with 401ks, with jobs and benefits, and who's making money and who's spending money and all these billionaires that have money. And it seems to be pretty important even though we claim it's not. And I, I think some of the things that are going on is we tend to forget that as Americans, we already are very wealthy. And when you're wealthy, this survey showed, you, you tend to not say that wealth is really important to you. But compared to the majority of the people in the world who are living on a couple of dollars a day, people who are struggling to meet basic needs, people around the world who are trying to find food and clean water, people who have no access to medical care, we in America tend to be the 1% where we're extremely wealthy. And even then, in all that we have as a majority, and there are poor people in this country, and I'm not trying to minimize that, but I'm saying, as a country, we're extremely wealthy. And we still think it's important to be wealthy, to get more money. We don't have enough. So there is this, this idea of people wanting to be successful and, and having not just everything they need, but a lot of what they want. So some of the distortions, some of the ways these people look at God and the Bible wrong. Well, when it, when it comes to authority, again, the successful people place value in what provides material comfort. They, they, they want to live the life that they want to live. They want to have enough to go on vacations, to have clothing, to have a house. And the houses in this country are getting bigger and bigger and bigger at the turn of the 1900s, you know, eight, 900 square foot of, of house for families that had multiple children was, was the average, and now people are wanting 1,200, 2,000, 3,000 square foot. The, the, the ultra-rich having 25,000 square foot, that's, that's their authority in their life is they're doing well when they can have all of this. <clears throat> Excuse me, the religiously successful they believe that, that their success shows that they're blessed by God. That's the authority, that the more blessed I am, the more money I have, the more comfortable I am, the more vacations I can take. It just proves that, that, that God is blessing me. When it comes to God himself, the successful oftentimes don't spend a lot of time thinking about God. Like I said, I know people who say, oh, I'm glad you have religion, but I don't need it. I don't need God. My life is really, really good. You know, people who have really good jobs and make really good money and take vacations and have the houses and the cars and everything that they could possibly want, God's just not on their radar sometimes. Then you have the religiously successful. And again, they, they, they are believing they've been taught that what God desires ultimately for them is to be healthy and wealthy and they just have to have enough faith. And if they don't have health and wealth, then they don't have enough faith. And they have this, this image of God as being kind of like a celestial Santa Claus or a genie that, that will just say it the right way, will just believe it. And it's more than just belief because the people who preach this talk about saying it out loud, that you activate it, that you make it a reality when you don't just believe, but then you start speaking it into existence. Again, that's why it's called name it and claim it. And they do this with their health. Don't, don't say you have cancer. 
uh, rebuke cancer, um, say that you're going to get out of death, that that good job is going to come. And if you just keep saying that, it attracts good things in your life. Well, that's more New Age philosophy and teaching than it is biblical. So that, that's where that becomes a problem, a distortion that we need to address. Jesus. For the successful, the non-religious successful, Jesus is often a good person. He's a teacher, but they're going to do fine without him. Um, recently, uh, Elon Musk, who is you know, the richest man in the world right now when I'm filming this, he owns amazing companies, Tesla and SpaceX, and he's making billions of dollars, and he is trying to buy Twitter. <clears throat> he was on a, a podcast, a YouTube channel, with some Christians. And he admitted that Jesus was a good guy, that, that there is value in his teachings, but he still not surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. He can acknowledge the benefit of, of learning from him, but he doesn't feel the need to submit to him, to surrender his life, to admit that he's a sinner. Now, the religious, religious successful, they end up taking Jesus' atoning work on the cross, <clears throat> and they twist what is, what is told in the Bible as a spiritual blessing to a material one. They'll say things like, oh, by, by his stripes, by, by him being crucified and, and whipped for us, we're healed. And the Bible does say that. But it's not about me not getting sick or not being injured. It's about this spiritual healing that I get, that I'm a sinner outside of the grace of God, away from the presence of God, and I am healed of that sin sickness, and I'm now adopted as a child of God. So, so they, they take the spiritual reality of the kingdom of God, and they try to make it a physical one. Death, judgment, afterlife. For the non-religious successful, what I'm seeing in this country now is they're working to put off or postpone death. They are spending tons of money to stretch life out as long as you can. There's a ton of research into immortality science. How can you keep your body healthy and going forever? Or how do we download our consciousness into a computer and then put it into a robot? I mean, there's really sci there's really scientists, rich, rich, rich people are funding this kind of research because they think they can get to the point where they're never going to die. And the religious successful, they again believe, I'm successful, I'm blessed, I'm right with God. It is okay, so I'm going to be good once I die. They may be. They may have this sincere relationship with God, but we've got to help them because some people may have such a distortion that the Jesus they're worshiping is not the Jesus of the Bible. So as you're sharing Jesus, as you're evangelizing people, we've got to be keeping track of this stuff. So what would be a biblical example? There's tons of biblical examples. There's tons of successful, rich people in the Bible. And some of them went away from God, and some of them surrendered to God. I mean, in the New Testament alone, you get this rich young ruler, and he goes to Jesus, and he says, what do I got to do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know, you got to follow the commandments. He goes, well, I've done this my whole life. And he goes, okay, there's one thing you lack. There's one more thing you need to do. Give away everything you own to the poor, and then come follow me. And, and the Bible says that the, the rich man was really kind of taken aback at this. He had a lot of stuff, and that was too much to ask. So he, he walked away from salvation in Jesus Christ to keep his stuff. He was someone very successful who didn't realize what he truly needed. He didn't know what Jesus was truly offering. In Acts, you have um, th this woman, Lydia, who is a business owner, a home owner. She is from Thyatira, and she is very successful in this business that they've got. And she's in Philippi selling this, this clothing. She would dye, think, clothing purple. Uh, again, very important, very hard to do. She's out praying. She's pursuing God. She, she is looking for God, and, and Paul finds her and explains all about Jesus. And 
she realizes his worth and she invites him and his, his companions into her house and she probably hosted this, this family church in her own home, paying the expenses, probably very generously was helping Paul and, and his companions go out and tell other people about Jesus because her money was useful, but it wasn't the most important thing to her. But the example I want to show us tonight is found in the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea. And here's what we're going to read there in, in, in chapter 3. Because you say, I am rich. Oh, here, let me step back. This is Jesus talking to the church. This is why I say there are some religious successful people who are in trouble. Jesus says to the church, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that may, you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Oh, sorry, let me go back here. What you can understand is, is who he's talking to. Laodicea is a, a rich city. It is the, the center of, of banking, of, of commerce. It's got this clothing industry, this garment industry that's really successful. And they have a school of medicine that is second to none. And they specialize in this, this, this ointment for people's eyes to help cure blindness or vision problems. The people in this area had everything they could possibly need. And there were even people in the church that, that were depending on their financial wealth more than they were God. They don't need anything, so they don't really need to depend on God. And Jesus says, you don't even know how wretched you are, that you're miserable, that you're poor. You have all of this stuff, but you have nothing. You're blind and you're naked. And so he, he hits on these cultural points of them, of, of the commerce industry, the banking industry. You're really poor no matter how much money you think you have. And you need to get garments from me, not, not this clothing industry that you have here. That, that doesn't give you anything. You're clothed and your nakedness and covered in Christ. And then their, their medical school that they could brag about. You, know, you, you brag that you guys can cure blindness, but you're blind. You don't see what's really going on around you. So get salve from me. And then you're going to really see. Is it always bad to be successful? No, not at all. There are many, many, many Christian people who have resources and they use it to fund the kingdom. There are secular people who have a lot of money who do charity work and, and they invest in, and that's good. But there's something more important than any of that. And that is personally surrendering to Jesus Christ. It is making sure that he is your Lord and your Savior and depending on God for everything. And everything I've got, everything that I receive belongs to God ultimately. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm making it useful for the kingdom. And C.S. Lewis had a quote about Christian, in his book, Mere Christian, it was about Christian charity, Christian giving. And it goes something like this, that for the Christian, if our giving is not making us sacrifice something, if we're not giving something up, then it's really not Christian giving. If I can have everything I want and then I use extra, well, that doesn't cost me anything. But if I give up that new car, if I give up a vacation, if I'm willing to sacrifice the things I want to make sure that the kingdom grows, that's the kind of thing that Jesus was teaching us. What are you willing to sacrifice for the kingdom of God? And what does the Bible have to say about this issue of wealth and success? Jesus, when he was giving the Sermon on the Mount, said this in, in chapter 6 of Matthew. Do not stir up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will also be. For the successful, helping us remember that ultimately my home is not this earth, that everything will one day be restored under Christ, that, that the things of this world that maybe seem important to me now are going to be burnt up, or they're going to face the, the judgment of God. And it's not my house or my car or my record collection or what comic book collection, whatever you, you have that you think is important. It's not in eternity. And then Paul is, is, is talking to Timothy about a leader leading in the church and, and, and setting everything up in the church the way it should be. And, and he warns him in chapter 6, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. This issue of wealth is an important one. This, this idea of how we measure success shouldn't be in material things because that kind of success can ruin us. And he says, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many grief. The, there's a danger, there is a, a, a challenge we have in the American church when we are faced with so much success. Almost everybody has a cell phone and a house and TVs and internet and most families have more than one car and most families have food at home right now. Now, again, I'm not saying there's no poor in this country. There are. And we need to be reaching out to them. But we also get to overcome the temptation to be pursuing money, success, material things all the time. And I know that there is a risk in the church as much as there is outside of the church. And so when we're sharing God with people, when we're, we're sharing Jesus, we have to be aware of these, these distortions, these temptations, these challenges that people are going to face to put their hope in something besides Jesus and then share who he really is and what he really desires for them. Well, again, I hope this has been helpful. Um, we got a couple more weeks uh, to talk about these different spiritual profiles. We'll wrap it up in a conclusion, and then we'll talk about what we're going to study next. Well, God bless. Take care. See you later.